Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Ignite podcast. Today, we're delighted to have Sean Flynn, host of the Silicon Valley podcast. So I'm really thrilled to have him and also an investment banker, which is super cool. Uh, used to be a dream career of mine, so which I washed out of. But Sean, would love to uh, get an intro <laughs> from you uh, for the audience. I, I think I think that was a pretty pretty good intro right there. Just the oh, the guy's doing something super interesting that I'm glad I'm not doing. So. <laughs> well, to to be fair, I was an analyst and I was staring at spreadsheets 14 hours a day, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Yeah, uh, it's kind of funny when you're. In I never a career, made it past that stage. Yeah, yeah, it's funny when you're in a career where people brag about not using a mouse when they use Excel. And you're like, really? That's a that's a great accomplishment. <laughs> so you know all the macros. Okay. I know all great. the Excel shortcuts. <laughs> I remember my professor in college, um, when I was learning learning finance, and he's PhD level finance guy. And just him just going around the keyboard with all the keyboard shortcuts. I was I was in awe. Yeah. Like that's a that's a man who knows his his Excel. I'm just waiting for five years when AI comes in the picture and all these people are like, My my one skill set's broken. Like, what do I do now? <laughs> But um, yeah, now I just so, talk to the machine, right? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. I just want these, I want these, this, this process, make it, make this chart, make it. And then the person that, you know, spent 20 years figuring all this out is like shaking their head. But yeah, yeah, yeah. My intro. So um, investment banker mergers, acquisition, growth capital. A lot of people probably listening, especially the audience in Silicon Valley. When I introduce myself, they have no idea what an investment banker actually does. In fact, half the time they're like, oh, you're a VC. I'm like, no, I'm not a VC or. What do you invest in? I'm like, no, we run transactions. So the easiest way for what an investment banker is or what we do as an investment banker is so broad is think of it this way. You go through life, you meet that special someone, you get married, two equals become one. That's a merger. Now you're walking in the park hand in hand. You see this little puppy and you go, oh my gosh, if we take this puppy, bring it in our family, the family gets bigger, stronger, more love. You acquire that puppy through an acquisition. Now that puppy, well, it needs to go to the vet, it needs shots, it needs foods to go from this little puppy to this big dog to do that. That's money, that's growth capital. All those transactions, that's what I do on a daily basis. So I help companies looking to get acquired, looking to raise capital, looking to exit, and then also secondaries, companies that stay private longer than some of the investors want to sell that on the, find the other buyer to, to help them get right. some liquidity. So that, that's all I do, super simple running those processes, run those transactions. And, and then uh, to kind of review that, <clears throat> there's, a, there's kind of a window for you, right? Because there's the big time Goldman Sachs investment bankers that are running these multi-billion dollar IPO yeah. kind of stripe level things. And then you guys kind of fit into the, the middle of the market, kind of describe what that is. Yeah, so different, different skill sets, different competition, different for all these different levels, right? So if you're, say the transactions, you know, below 10 million, that, you know, you'll probably get a business broker or someone to facilitate that transaction. It'll probably be this passive process. Whereas we, we focus that lower mid market. So transactions between 10 and 250 million. That's our sweet spot. We run a very active process. I mean, it warrants an investment bank coming in at that size to, to bring in some competition. But, you know, once you get above 250, granted, we've done bigger transactions than that in our history. But there's a lot of competition from some of the more household names above that 250, that those Jeffries and those groups. So, I mean, there's there's different areas or different sandboxes that investment banks like to play in. We like to focus on that middle market. That's the skill set. That's our wheelhouse. Yeah, that's that's the niche we've carved out. Nice. So, what should a startup know before engaging with you? Let's say they've gotten to, I don't know, five million in revenue, and they're kind of, you know, looking to exit or um, they're like, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to do another round here. First thing I would, I mean, there's the planning and I mean, these transactions that we run, I mean, no in advance, they're six to nine months from start to end. And that's something that a lot of people have no idea because they're thinking for the most part, oh, I can sell my company over the weekend or something like that. Or, you know, this would be a, a, a quick Market done, walk away. When reality is this long process. So we actually tell everyone, hey, if you're thinking of selling in a year or two, more like two, you know, now's the time to really start having those conversations, not so much with us even, but with wealth advisors, with tax planners, with all these, you know, get in your 
advisory team together because you know just saying you want to run a process that's great but if you haven't thought about that all in advance some of your options may not be there when you run this process i mean some of that those tax strategies some of that wealth building i mean who knows what it is but it's 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 individual i mean each person's going to have a different situation for them some person's lifestyle might need this huge exit and where their company's at right now doesn't warrant that other people are hey actually you live a pretty comfortable life and you don't need that huge exit that you're planning five years from now if you want you could actually exit probably next year and with the amount you'll get from that how it's structured with your advisors how it goes out tomorrow all that you could live the way you want or get to that do that next thing in your life that you're interested so i mean for us one of the good things is just come to us talk to us tell us what you're thinking of have those advisors that you're talking to you know wealth tax everyone else talk to people that have gone through the process i mean brian i'm sure people have come to you over over time and be like yeah i'm thinking of selling my business what's that process like what's some feedback some advice you can give because I mean, honestly, one of the biggest things also that people aren't aware of is the emotional roller coaster that these transactions have. I mean, you're talking huge swings. One day you're on cloud nine. This is the greatest thing ever. The next day you're not even getting out of bed. And there's these huge mood swings from, you know, when you're deciding it's time to go out to, okay, we're, we're getting all the marketing material together. Now we're marketing that. Now we're having conversations with the buyers now we're in due diligence all those things huge swings huge swings yeah so i mean there's a lot there not sure where you want to take the conversation but yeah first thing you know from day one just start having those conversations what does an exit look like is my company ready what should i start looking at to prepare it and who should i start talking to to really know what to expect and to start preparing because a lot of people are involved and you got to you got to trust these people in advance. I you don't want to pick a an M and A lawyer, you know, the day before drafting documents. You want to know right. that person in advance. You want that person to to know your risk tolerance. You want to know that M and A attorney's risk tolerance. And the last thing you want is, you know, you'd be this person that's like go 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 go, and the lawyer's like stop 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 stop. You know, you kind of want them to know who you are you to know who they are yeah everyone on your team you want to get to know in advance i don't know i mean brian have you ever come across those situations where people just even for raising capital or that you just see them like the last minute call up some attorney to look over some term sheet or something like that and you're thinking Mm. wait why didn't you get these people on board way in advance and plan for it you'd be in such a better situation so yeah planning in in advance my startups (laughs) <laughs> None of yours, of course, of course. Um, but I'd, I'd love to go back to how you got into this this field of work. You know, kind of what's the origin story there? It's not the typical investment banker story. In fact, everyone when they look at my LinkedIn, half of them are, are like, "Wait, you did mechanical engineering as your major in theater as a minor? How did how does that work?" I'm like, "Yeah, it works." But my journey was after college i wanted to to go overseas i mean the whole time in college i really wanted to travel but i didn't get the opportunity mainly because i was studying you know mechanical engineering is not the easiest major but after i graduated i went overseas for about eight years costa rica for two china for about five and then uh europe for a little while and some other places but in that time got to start a couple companies uh sold one did okay Came back to the U.S., got involved with the startup community, got involved with an angel group. And then with that angel group, I was brokering some deals between, and this is before the trade war, with Chinese accelerators and incubators and investors sent up facilities in Silicon Valley and this Mm. angel group that had 20 years of connections. And then one of the accelerators backed by the second largest privately owned land development company, made a, a good offer, went on board, joined that team. And I was helping companies set up operations and do roadshows between here in China, the tech park. So, you know, we take mm. a couple of companies from Silicon Valley, maybe some from Germany, Israel, put them in a cohort, bring them over there for a little while, check out 
a couple of facilities. Hey, here's a location you might like. Here's another, you know, not to relocate, but for when they open up their Chinese office to be in one of these these tech parks. And then you also seek overseas investment and that. And in that process, I had to know a ton of investment bankers. I got to know a, a lot of, you know, just a lot of people in this industry. And, um, you know, after a while, a couple of them started saying, Sean, you know, what you're doing right there is basically what we do. You know, you've already made some introductions that have helped us out a lot that we've, you know, been able to benefit from. Why don't you come on board? And uh, I was at Stern Ventures for a short time. And then from that, I went over to Global Capital Markets, who I knew from before, just because one of the companies they'd raised capital for was looking for a manufacturer in Shenzhen. And through contacts, I was able to make some intros. But one of the things that I've really kind of prided myself on is just keeping and building relationships, keeping those warm over time and always doing my best. So, you know, even from something years and years ago, I was able to build relationships with the team. And when the right moment came, it was, okay, move over to this group. And so I've been at this investment bank now for about four years. Uh, it's been fantastic. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. Gotten to work on some incredible projects. Uh, and that's the cool, I think that's the coolest thing about being an investment banker focused on mergers acquisition is just you get to dive deep at you know, on one company and really know 90, 95% of that company. And you're working on maybe mm. three or four projects a year. So you just go so deep. It's almost like you're doing a new mm. startup every project where you're learning about that. all the company's yeah. processes. You're learning about the team, their background, why they're in their positions. You're learning about, you know, their their their, their financial forecast moving forward and how they envision the growth. And, and you learn about their past and the good times and bad times and the stumbling blocks. And, and you have to be able to answer questions that aren't in the market material, the SIM, when, you know, yeah. potential buyers or investors ask. And, and so you have to, you have to know that company in and out. And it's just fantastic. Like, why are these patterns important? Tell me, why is this tech important? Tell me. And you're just, you're just diving down the mm. rabbit hole. So it, it's, it's one of those um, professions where you never stop working and, and it's probably a good thing for anyone right now that's listening that might be thinking, oh, it could be fun. I mean, maybe go back to what Brian said earlier, how he, he's glad <laughs> he's not doing this. I think, I, I think I'd have a lot more fun in the VC life. Uh, but it, it's, it's incredible. Uh, pros and cons. Pros and cons. Pros I don't get cons. to dive as deep as that Yeah, sure. in, the, in the early stage stuff. Um, but I, lo I love this origin where you naturally – uh, gravitated into the career, got pulled into it because you were already kind of naturally doing it on the side. Yeah, no, it, it was kind of funny. Yeah, I love that. I mean, what I was doing was just taking companies over there, prepping them in advance, you know, getting everything ready for in investor meetings, government meetings, all these meetings with, you know, the the key decision makers over there, and um, it, it's pretty much the same thing. It's pretty much you're packaging yeah. the company, you're creating the story, you're bringing that story to life, and you're putting that story in front of the the people at the other side of the table and seeing how much they resonate with that story. And then, you know, from there, hopefully we have a deal. So it's, yeah, there's so many similarities. And, and you know, it kind of goes back to maybe even theater a little bit and storytelling and who knows. <laughs> I love that mechanical engineering and a minor in theater. Uh, what a combo! <laughs> something, something outside of just looking at a computer screen. I needed something. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Tell us about the inception of the Silicon Valley podcast. Kind of what made you get started there, and kind of what have you learned over the years of of doing that podcast? Oh man, I've I've learned a ton. So the beginning, the origins of it was, I was having the same conversations over and over again with founders because, yeah, we were helping companies from Silicon Valley go to China, but we're also helping Chinese companies set up operations in Silicon Valley. And the companies could be from other locations as well. You know, it helped a couple of German companies from European set up uh, operations. But the conversations, exact same, over and over again. You know, tell us about, you know, how do we create a pitch deck? How do we talk to investors? How do we sign a commercial lease? How do we, do, you know, over and over again, same conversation. And then mm -hmm. one day I was um, at Leadership Mountain View, which is this group. It meets for once a month for nine months. It's the companies in Mountain View. You know, Microsoft's a part of it, Adobe, all these. 
and they have one representative more or less in government relations to learn about the city, learn about how they can help the community. And I was the representative for the company I was at. And one day we took a tour and we fa- and I found out that they had a public access TV station, KMVT 15. And I was looking at that after just having, once again, the same meeting for the 30th time. And I went, wait a second, why am I not recording these? I can just record mm. these meetings and then have this reference library mm. and just point people to it. Yeah. God, this would be, this would save me so much I had a podcast hassle. on that. Yeah. That, that's how I it I had evolved. a similar epiphany. Yeah. I, I went on someone's podcast and I realized like, wait, I have a hundred plus portfolio companies, lots of interesting startups and people like you to talk to. Uh, I could just record these sessions, these Zoom calls and just put them out there for the world so people can get some value yeah. from them. It was kind of a similar epiphany. Yeah. And the conversations are ones you want to have anyway. It, you know, it's so much fun. That's part of my job is just talking to interesting people and learning things. And I was like, wait, yeah. I'll just record that and put that out there. <laughs> so that'd be, that's the whole origin of the podcast for me. It started off as a public access TV show. It was in 28 cities. Uh, and then oh, wow. I signed a contract. I didn't know that. It was, it was actually a public access television. Yeah, the, no, the I show did 46 was. episodes oh, wow. originally, and it was called Silicon Valley Successes. And it was hilarious because all these, like, I would get an email from a random city that I'd never heard of. And they're like, we're so happy to have a Silicon Valley show on our public access TV station. I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm so Great. glad that it's in your city, you know? <laughs> and um, from that, a podcast platform, they wanted to do a podcast on the Silicon Valley. We had conversations. I was on their platform for six months. And um, then afterwards, I wanted to branch off on my own. I rebranded, and that became the Silicon Valley Podcast. So now, I mean, through Silicon Valley Successes, that was completely separate. I had 46 episodes there. The podcast itself, I've had uh, 217 episodes now. So total, you know, wow. with the ones in the hopper and everything, we're getting close to 300 interviews over the years. So it's been a journey. How, how, many, uh, how many years? Did it take to get to, to almost 300? Uh, what did it start? Four years ago now? Five? No, no. Count okay. Silicon Valley successes, we'd be at like five and a half. Yeah, so that sounds right. About an episode a week, episode or two yeah. a week. And the only break I really and, ever did was during the pandemic for a few months there. That was it. Other than that, it's been yeah. pretty continuous. Well, now we just do everything on Riverside or Zoom or whatever, and we're all virtual oh, yeah. anyway. I'm get- So when you started, it was in person. Well, actually, almost all of, of all the episodes I've done, like the Silicon Valley says, all those were in person. The podcast itself of the 217, I think about 200 of them have been in person. So my yeah. goal is actually to do all my interviews in person, face to face. I I just really want to build rapport with the people. And, and plus, you know, you have that time before the recording and after to get to know them and, yeah. and talk. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it, I should just so start I, recording I, those. Just right away, just record oh it God. and just put, put that behind the scenes. There, there's so many times <laughs> where people, and I'm sure you've experienced this too. Hey, we're not yeah. recording, right? Okay, let me yeah, tell yeah, you yeah. more about what I just said. Yeah, like, let oh. me tell you actually. Yeah, there's a little bit of behind the scenes <laughs> magic that happens in in these recording sessions. Oh, and Silicon it's Valley so is I- ironic. <laughs> yeah, Silicon Valley itself. Like once you start hearing some of these stories, how these companies were made, or these CEOs, and mm. you just shake your head and you're like, these are all soap operas. Like how lucky could yeah. anyone get, or how did that really? I <laughs> you just shake your head. It's how well, you you realize actually as you get older how much luck plays into success, right? And oh, it's right huge. place, right time. Yeah, it's like oh yeah, yep. we landed that big partner, and that helped us land this other customer, and then that customer is a lighthouse customer that helped us land that one, and then oh, it, and that attracted this you know hundred X engineer to our company that allowed us to do this thing in the tech stack, and, and you're like yeah. Uh, so basically, you're just a pinball kind of jumping around in the pinball machine. <laughs> like, yeah, you just got lucky. Like those dominoes, you just happen like to hit that the jackpot. First, yeah, yeah, that first one that fell three years ago, set up today. Really? As you, you know, you're like, I thought I was just being lazy and didn't want to go to, to that event. Instead, I just went to the grocery store. And now we got this. Yeah, it's it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So it's so ironic uh, as well that I have a podcast because you know, ten or fifteen years ago when they came out. I really didn't like them. I was much more of an audiobook person, reading books. And I read, you know, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of books I've read at this point. 
I got to the point though, where technology is moving so fast that I realized I was getting more up to date and interesting information from podcasts than it was from, from books. And that's kind of when I shifted it. It happened over the last, I'd say four or five years where I was like, wait, I'm, I'm having, I'm learning a lot more listening to podcasts of, of actual people like you that do investment banking in Silicon Valley or, you know, people that are investing or people building AI and, and, and machine learning. Um, then I, then I was like reading some O'Reilly book or, you know, something that was written. It's already out of date when it's published. Have you ever had that experience where you've just listened to a podcast and you always do it at like two X, two and a half X speed. And then you meet I'm the 1. person 5 for the first to two. time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that. I've totally what done is that. wrong with your voice? Why is it so slow? I well, guess there's disconnect it's, it's so funny you mentioned that because i went back and i listened to some of my earlier episodes and i'm i'm kind of a fast talker already probably because i listened to everything at 1.5 or 2x and i realized i'm you know if i listen to myself at 1.5x i'm talking way too fast it's just it's like you almost can't even make it out <laughs> like i gotta slow it down into a radio announcer voice oh god <laughs> today we have sean flynn on the podcast I don't know Brian, if I can do that. I, I can't maintain I'm that. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited for, <laughs> for the conversation. It's all the cliche things. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah. so it's an honor. Back it's my to honor to be it's, it's here. An, it's an honor. It is an honor. <laughs> this is, I'm so glad you're on the podcast because I can shoot the shit in a pod like, <laughs> with a fellow host. Across the 250, 300 episodes you've done, Like, what are some that stand out? You're like, wow, that was, that was an amazing episode. I've I've had so many to be honest where I've just yeah. left shaking my head going that did that pivoted someplace I had no idea it was yeah. going to go or and just some of the takeaways like the first 30 episodes I was so nervous and and then mm. after a while you're just like wait these are just random regular people and then yeah. you start noticing kind of different patterns like I think one of my one of my earliest episodes that, that stand out, I got to interview Jim McKelvey, a co-founder of Square, right? Mm. And none of my audio worked. Nothing worked. Like, we blocked off an hour. The first 10 minutes was me doing this, you know, moving my <laughs> arm, shaking, because no Zoom audio. was not connecting. Oh, no. And, you know, me typing in the chat, I'm so sorry. And he's just sitting there and he just types in the chat. I blocked off an hour. You're good. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, I just. It, it was just one of those yeah. moments that I was like, wait, he's just a normal guy. He's just, you know, you yeah. blocked off an hour. How cool is that? So just that kind of experience stood out in my mind. Another another experience. And this one, this one's pretty, pretty funny. So I got to interview. My first interview ever was Melody Perkins, founder of Canva. That was first interview ever. And the mm. podcast platform I was on, they were, they were like, hey, Sean, all these interviews have to be 45 minutes because we want three uh, commercial breaks every 15 minutes. And, you know, Melody's team wanted the questions pre-approved. I sent them in. Well, the thing was, Melody answered the questions like that. So Yeah, so fast. So you ran out of stuff in, to talk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 20 minutes in, I was like, I'm oh, no. so sorry. I don't have any other questions, but. We really need more time. Is there any questions I can ask you? And me, Melanie, and her marketing head just started brainstorming questions. And we were like <laughs> writing them nice. down. I was like, oh, I can ask that. Okay, that's good. All right. Okay, talk about your new uh, in China, opening up there. And, and you know, there, I got so many experiences like that, that once they're edited, you have no idea because it's all clean. Mm -hmm. It looks seamless. Mm -hmm. Jim McKelvey seemed seamless. Seemed like the perfect interview, but in the background there was chaos. Melly Perkins. A lot of these interviews are, you know, shit shows more yeah. or less. But then after yeah. post, you're like, oh man, that was such an easy interview. So clean, so so polished. <laughs> so. That's that's one of the, the the fun parts about doing it is I, I'll create these outlines right, and um, I use ChatGPT to create the outline. Obviously, I don't have time to like write out you know this long two or three page outline. So I basically plug people's LinkedIn profiles into chat GPT and I say, Hey, write an outline. And then, uh, inevitably I just fail to follow the outline completely and <laughs> shoot the shit. <laughs> like I might ask a few questions from the outline and then, and then it's just like a meandering conversation on whatever yeah. comes to mind. 
but it's that nice security blanket in the back there. It's like, okay, if there's that pause, I can always fall back on this. And the guest has kind of seen that this is the outline of proof. So they're comfortable, they're relaxed. Instead of, I don't know, I've noticed if I've never sent those podcast questions in advance, the first five minutes are just these jitters where it's like, is he going to send, is he going to give me one of those I got you questions? But yeah, you know, yeah. Just, just having something I think it there puts where the guest you don't even use when they have an outline. It's like, yeah, here's generally, I want to know about your background, what you're currently doing in the future. That's usually how I kind of structure it. And then I do a rapid yeah. fire. That's typically how I've been structuring it. And actually the rapid fire ends up, ends up having like the most interesting conversations because then we'll oh, talk I about bet. a book or like some productivity hack or, you know, whatever. But, you know, back to the outline, I'd love to talk yeah. about, you know, we, we know where you're from, you know, we know what you do, what you're doing. How do you think it's going to shift over the next, you know, five or 10 years? How do you see, um, you know, venture capital, private equity, investment banking, um, AI, the intersection of that, the proliferation of software and AI, like yeah, kind of opine on I, kind of the, oh the coming I think, years? I think the whole, I think the whole industry is investment banking. I think it's going to be disrupted. I really do. Because, I mean, one of the biggest values that investment bankers bring to deals is being able to connect those sellers with buyers. And that yeah. market, there's so much inefficiency in the private market. I mean, we're not talking the public, the stocks that everyone knows about where it's right. the newspaper, it's liquid. We're talking private companies where that ideal buyer may never, ever hear about that company and vice versa. Mm. So investment bankers, you know, we have all these databases. We have our teams, we have our researchers, we have all this stuff matching them what's going to stop ai in a few years from just doing that i mean really there's there's some incredible this is interesting software right because i've seen yeah i've seen similar things in the venture capital space with platforms trying to create uh vc startup marketplaces and yeah and i just don't think they work because yeah there's lots of startups yeah there's lots of vcs and i think there's more of both over time but i, I think fundamentally it's a relationship game right where you know, oh, Sean's investing in this. Let me take a look. Uh, I have a founder that is saying, "Hey, I, I know this other founder starting a company, or they're, they're they've hit some some good milestones. You should take a look." And so, it, it, but I th the best deal flow comes from people who know you, right? And they know what you look for, and yeah, I I definitely agree. But I think it's also a little bit of the difference of the stages, right? It's like so early yeah. on in the company's life cycle, it's so yeah. much about the founders and those relationships and the team. Where later middle market, so much of it is the metrics, the numbers, and it's mm. just plug it in. Okay, we got this revenue, this EBITDA, this sector, this geographic location, and all this stuff. All right, your private equity group. Guess what? Nine out of those ten boxes are ticked. You know, let's have that conversation. Or hey, strategic. You know, you're you're interested in this type of technology. They got it. Your smallest check is this size. They've hit that. Or family office. I think. You know, earlier stage, yeah, definitely the because the team and intro, all that. It's intro based, yeah, yep. But later on, I mean, and that's just one area. I think I think AI is going to come in the picture for matching up cultures at business and do an analysis of that far in advance. I, I think it's going to mm. come in to do even acquisition roadmaps. I think it's going to come in and do the integration process, best best practices and timeline. There's just so many. Let me, let me ask you a question it, about about yeah. private markets real quick, because you think about this a lot, especially in the middle market. Our co companies are staying private longer than ever. Yeah. You know, a lot of these companies are valued at $10, $50, 100000000000 billion <laughs> privately, which is crazy. And they yeah. intend to go IPO at some point. But do you feel like there's a pullback that will happen back to kind of a normal IPO window uh, or M&A window? Or do you feel like this trend is here to stay that companies should stay private longer? I don't know. I mean, this is a question I, I've talked to a lot of people about. And, you know, the conversation, some of it goes to, well, if the regulators made it easier on, on companies when they're public instead of quarterly reporting every, you know, twice a year and all these other things, it would be more appealing to companies. Mm. And then you'll have, you know, private companies. I mean, gosh, I had a conversation with a company not too long ago, and they're doing a hundred million ARR. And, mm. you know, my, my thought was kind, hey, kind of know, the spot where typically you go IPO, a hundred million ARR, right? Yeah. But, but their conversation, yeah. 
yeah but there was you know what we're not we're not looking at that because if we went public it's not liquid enough for us there's not that liquidity that that we're looking for and the only way we're going to get that is to get acquired by a strategic or you know a private equity or something get acquired that's the only way we're well, going to get a higher multiple that... most likely if it's a strategic m a tuck-in kind yeah. of thing right like instead of going yeah. uh to the public markets and you get like six or seven x revenue Maybe a strategic's like, hey, that's really valuable on our balance sheet, and we're going to pay fifteen x or twenty x. Yeah, I mean, is that kind of the, the size the of the calculation company and that? Yeah. But it's it was more the, you know, they go get acquired by a strategic. They all have a liquidity event, right? More or less, depend on the structure of the deal. Maybe it's yeah. there's, there's some earn outs, earn outs and stuff, and like, stuff that. like that. And, yeah. Whereas the stuff, you know, going public. There's only going to be what a million, two million float or something like that. I mean, how how long would it take to be able to off your shares? Because there's not that many shareholders in this company without, without tanking the price, the... right? <laughs> yeah, and you're like, good point. Never thought about that. And yeah. what is there seven trillion in private equity money just sitting on the side right now? Or so? I mean, I, I just mm. interviewed Adam Coffey, the um, uh, the author of Private Equity Playbook. And he was talking about the most insane numbers of just dry powder right now. And and that's, you know, that we know of. He, you know, there's also in the conversation of all this overseas money that's just looking to, to come to the U.S. to pick up private companies that, you know, people don't really know an exact number for. And you hear stuff like that. You're like, our company is going to go public when there's all this, you know, capital on the side. I have no idea, but I I think mm. I do think the investment bank and industry is going to be disrupted. I also and and this one's I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. I think the VC industry is going to get disrupted quite a bit as well in yeah. the coming years. How so? so? Like I'd love to I'd love to know so I can prepare. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well one area that I. Well, going back to the match, and I think a lot more family offices in that that in the past were investing in, in VC funds are going to try to go direct. I also yeah, think I see that. that yeah. I also think that um, a lot. Well, uh, two other things. One, I think some startups are going to try to go more the crowdfunding route versus the micro VCs mm. and early VC. And then the final one is I think venture studios are going to get more and more popular. And I'd love to get your thoughts, especially on that third one, yeah. but on any of those. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some stati statistics historically where venture studios outperform um, your, your standard venture capital fund uh, on average, right? And, mm. and I think that's because you're, you're kind of setting up a, a professional team from the beginning. Uh, you're understanding, hey, there's a market need with, with a big TAM and lots of friction here. We got... Uh, proof of concept or some sort of MVP out that people are actually paying for. Uh, so we know we have something here and it's, it's sort of like a way to uh, accelerate an idea. It's like a pre-accelerator. Uh, maybe you might describe it like that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's for... definitely interesting. I've invested in a handful of, you know, venture studio backed companies. It's definitely something I look for, but I mean, I think, I don't know, the time will tell, right? Cause if, if you step back and think about, as an early stage VC, what we're looking for is we're looking for teams that can ring the NASDAQ bell, right? Uh, is how I describe it, right? You see them on stage. And, you know, oh, God, that's, that's on my, one of my bucket list items to somehow do that one day. I haven't figured out how. Maybe yeah, I'd, lo I'd love for hours, one of my... But... Yeah, just once. Uh, there's this funny <laughs> meme of Jason Calacanis going around ringing the bell at, on the Uber, but he's not actually there. Um, I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> at the uber ipo and they kind of photoshopped them in i think it was recently on the all-in pod it was hilarious um but yeah i think i think you know and you know you have to think about you know a startup is going to take 10 to 15 years really to, to fully mature and get to that ipo stage and uh, typically anyway and do you see a venture studio backed you know a mercenary ceo for hire doing that sometimes maybe yeah. you know but are they going to stick it out and do they have enough equity and all that stuff to, to really be the visionary founder that can take this thing to a multi-billion dollar outcome? Well, I'm not even sure with how quickly technology moves, if that's really going to be the thought process moving forward. I mean, 
in the past, it was, I'm going to build a company, take it to the exit event. Everyone always says the IPO, but you know, in reality, it's mostly an exit. I think the future with how quick technology is changing is going to be build a company and just have a five-year exit plan and just sell it to a strategic mm. after that five yeah. years. And I think that's where venture studios or those models could really come in where it's, okay, we take an idea, we build it, proof of concept, we got sales, strategic comes in, mass mass adoption. Just that model instead of building it yourself because 10 years now is so long in tech. Yeah. It's cr- so. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. A lot to think about, but you're the VC. So <laughs> I just, I just want to help your companies exit when they're ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, I think the trends are probably on your side. You know, if I had to predict, um, you know, a lot of companies now are going default alive. They're raising less capital. They're much more efficient, right? Uh, on a per employee basis, a full FTE kind of basis, they're able to generate revenue at a, at a quicker pace, quicker than ever and innovate faster. Um, all because of gen AI, frankly, right. They're able just to automate so much more. Um, and I, I don't remember where I heard this, but I don't know if Sam Altman said this directly, but he says, you know, there might already exist a company that will have a billion dollar valuation with one, one founder, um, which that is, would be which awesome. is pretty insane. You know, that'd be a pretty, huge change for society is one person companies with a with a swarm of ai agents helping them create value for society right and then you layer on things like robotics and and other information technologies that are accelerating everything and just feeding on itself and uh, we could end up in this uh, very weird place where uh, maybe companies don't even raise money right <laughs> right they just talk to talk to machines and the machines build the things that they need on the fly and there's no need to have a Figma to review UX and there's no need to have a micro VC to, to write you little, you know, pre-seed checks because you can just talk to the machines and they'll just build whatever you're looking for. So I'm that, just thinking about you know, that right pretty... now. I mean, how, how crazy would that be just to have like an AI bot and just go, okay, negotiate all my partnership contracts. This is what I want to do at the end. Yeah. And then it just go out partnership contract, partnership, like all these contracts. And then take that idea, and next thing you know, you have mass distribution, sales, all like all these referral agreements, all these commissions, all these structures. Next thing you know, it's a billion dollar company yeah. just from sitting there telling the AI to. <laughs> How awesome would that yeah, be? Yeah, I need an SDR. Instead of hiring an SDR bot, I can hire an AI to do the exact same stuff, which is go out and make 100 or 200 cold emails a day on LinkedIn and around the, the web on Twitter or whatever, wherever you can find people and just reach out to them, like, hey, here's my product or service. You know, do you want to? want to buy it i think you'd be a good fit you know and and then you just kind of schedule demos and then eventually the demo is automated by an ai and you don't know it's not an ai talking to you um it's a brave new world right like it just kind of changes business and i'm i'm seeing some you know some sparks of this now with and people that listen to this podcast know i'm such a future techno optimist kind of guy that um but i've been following this stuff for decades now since i read kurzweil's books in the late 90s right and you know i'm running into companies now where you know they have a million of ar and, and no employees right they just yeah. maybe have a couple contractors and a bunch of ai and they have a million of revenue and that's insane yeah without any outside funding they did no outside it in, funding know, just bootstrapped short yeah. amount of time you know nights yeah. and week or whatever and, and the person doesn't want to grow it they just want to flip it because they got 10 other ideas and you're shaking yeah. your head, you're like, that's incredible. Yeah, and there's lots of examples even from 10 years ago, like WhatsApp and Instagram and companies like that. I mean, I shared an office with Instagram when they got acquired back in 2011, Wait, 2012. <laughs> yeah, that was my first tech job in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I was, uh, we both, I was working at a solar startup uh, one block off the grid and we were backed by NEA. And we had one, like most of the t- former Twitter offices in South Park. I'm talking about like 80%. Uh, and, and, and Instagram had this like small little corner of the office yeah. and then they got acquired for, you know, a billion dollars and we basically went out of business. I think we sold for one or two X revenue or something like that. <laughs> and, um, I was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, what, what, you know, the, the, these kind of quiet, yeah. were they in stealth types? mode at all during that time? Or were you just looking over their shoulder going, Hey, what are you doing? They're like, add this little, 
little yeah, thing. Yeah, we'd share phone. pizza and beer with them and stuff and hang out and play ping pong, whatever. But yeah, it was really strange when they got acquired for a billion. You're like, what happened? Just what happened there? Um, and I, I can imagine just that, you know, somebody like me is seeing WhatsApp get acquired for whatever it was, 42 billion or 27 billion. And, you know, they had 40 employees. It's like almost a billion per employee. Yeah. I think we've already seen yeah. this in software, and now AI is just going to make that even more insane uh, in the in the coming years. Well, I'm just waiting for that unicorn company from you know areas of the world that we haven't heard of any type of technology come from. You know, like who knows? Yeah, some maybe kid in someone, Africa with a, a with an Android yeah. phone, you know, hundred dollar Android a Sherpa, phone, but some a Sherpa in the yeah. Himalayas, you know, coding <laughs> with his, you know. <laughs> right before summoned in the peak is like okay i'm done <laughs> yeah here i built this it's the next flappy bird <laughs> sells like you know 100 million copies for a dollar each and he's sitting on a yacht somewhere in indian ocean uh would love to yeah. switch and do some rapid fire before we leave um back to kind of your world traveler where would you go back to to you know live if you had to leave california Ooh, to live, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know, I kind of want to go back to Costa Rica, but maybe Europe. The, I mean, everything's got pros and cons, right? Because, yeah. I mean, Costa Rica was so nice, but you couldn't, it was difficult to build things because of, you know, everyone, Tranquilo, Puerto Vida, you know, every 40 minutes late to this hour, like, eh, not, let's not put it too much effort. And They're kind of like on island time down there, like Caribbean time. Yeah. Oh, Oh, it was such an island. Trinidad and Tobago was pretty cool. That I maybe go back. Mm. I don't know. There's a lot of places, but right now in my life, I kind of I yeah. want to build, create. I want to do transactions. I really enjoy. I mean, I really like Silicon Valley just for the people I meet. Like I don't. Yeah. In all my travels, and I've been to quite a, you know, outside of living abroad for eight years. Even after that, I was. I mean, last year I went to what five countries, six countries. Um, you know, still, still a lot for work. But the people I meet in Silicon Valley, they're just so interesting. I mean, there's what one third are, are immigrants from that have these stories of building this company and exiting right. that company or writing this book or winning this prize or getting a PhD here or that. All day long here, I'm just having the, the greatest conversations. And it's so, so amazing the ideas I hear and the people I meet. So, I mean, I'm pretty excited just living in Silicon Valley. If I had to live anyplace else in the world, Maybe I would go. Maybe I'd go Europe just because I I love learning languages, and it would be fun just to go. You know, a couple months here, pick up a language. Six months there, pick up a language. Um, That's maybe, the cool maybe, part about maybe being maybe in a place like there. Silicon Valley or New York is the world kind of comes to you, and you yeah. meet people from all over the world, and so it's kind of addicting, and it's hard to kind of break out of that. I mean, I've lived in Hawaii, I've lived in the Caribbean, New York, Japan. And California's the best. I live out here on a lake and, you know, closer to Tahoe than I am San Francisco now. And I can't imagine like going anywhere else at this point. Um, I mean, I yeah. want to spend part of the year down in the tropics, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, same kind of love where I live. Yeah. What's, um, what's one book that you've run across that people frequently recommend when they come on your show? What's Ooh. one book that kind of comes up a lot? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe business model canvas. Mm. I think that comes up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that, yeah, I love one. that one. That was um design thinking, kind of thinking about all that your whole series all the is quality. Rectangles. Yeah. What's your partnership model? What's your revenue model? Yeah, I remember that. Um what's your go to relaxation activity? So before the pandemic, it was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I have not trained in what four years now. Oh wow! Yeah, I think it's been four years, maybe You're five. The second guest in a row now uh, to talk about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and how amazing it is. Oh man, I got my purple belt, and this oh, was wow. years ago. And uh, my twenty twenty four. That's an accomplishment. Goals. Getting a purple is like not by accident. That's not like karate, oh, karate, you... and your seven getting a purple belt. That is dedication over how many years was that? Oh my gosh! So that was probably what. Well, on and off for seven years, and that seven yeah. years probably five years, and, and a lot solid of going, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was actually funny if you if you look online. 
other than some of the the females from China, almost all the males I had trained with when I was living in China at China Top Team. So Li Jinlan, all those guys, I remember them when they're, you know, white belt straight from, you know, Inner Mongolia coming to the gym. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I actually submitted this guy. And now I look at them on TV. I'm like, these guys are beast. Oh, my God. <laughs> so. So yeah. So why'd you stop doing it? I mean, you probably got some benefit from it. It was a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, the pandemic. That was that. I mean, no one wanted to have Uh, any physical contact with people. It's you know, it's a close combat sport. You're sweating on people, like everything, right? So haven't haven't trained in years, and you know, it's one of those things now where I've just come up with excuses, going on business trips, going on, you know, doing working on this project. Because Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is one of those sports where you don't want to go once a week. You want to go like minimum three times a week so you can kind of see that improvement. Yeah. And allocating those, you know, two hour slots three times a week, it's it's a challenge. But it's it something is, yeah. that, you know, my buddy who I used to beat up all the time, who was a blue <laughs> belt when I was a purple, he kept with it. Now he just got his brown belt the other week, sending me pictures right. of him with his brown belt. I'm like, damn it. You know, you passed me by. Okay, yeah. I gotta play catch up now. So, yeah, no, it's it's an amazing sport. If, you, if you've never yeah, tried, you got it. You gotta try it. I've done a few classes. I'll probably uh, start doing it again now that my my two boys are getting old enough to do it. Yeah, teenagers now, so it'd be kind of fun to do a mixed age class and submit my my fourteen year old and put him in his place a little bit. There you go. <laughs> be tough for another another four years, and then it's it's okay. <laughs> There is something magical about that three times a week, though, because I play basketball and I notice if I play once a week, I get worse at it over time. Twice, I twice a week, I kind of maintain and three times a week I lose weight and I get better, even even in my 40s now. And I think there is something exactly about when it's a physical activity, doing it three times a week. So every other day, practically, um, you just get better at it. And yeah, everything, everything goes better. So you, you said you love learning languages. What's your favorite language and why? I mean, Chinese, I spent, or Mandarin, I spent the most time learning it. And that was, that was brutal. Um, but like most things, you know, you don't use it, you, you lose it. So I forgot a lot yeah. of it. The, a language I do, there's one language I'm really interested in learning. I want to pick up French. And because mm. uh, I see so much opportunity in Africa in the coming years. In the next decade or two, with yeah, how population many African countries that. speak French? It's a, it's a handful, right? It's a good amount, five it's or a, six. It's a good amount, and yeah, most most French speaking countries, they I almost want to say they make an effort not to learn English. I, like it's crazy. <laughs> I'll go to Asia and the youth; they all speak you know adequate yeah. English. Or yeah. I was in the Ivory Coast last year, and actually I was on a call with a group recently. And the English, yeah, you have the translator, but other than the translator, nope, no, no English spoken. Perfect yeah, we speak French. French. Yeah, yeah. That was and, actually uh, the interesting part of going to Colombia for me. I went to Colombia recently, and you know, you're used to going to Latin countries and they speak English, but not in Colombia. Colombia is like no, nope. Spanish. Really? They speak Spanish here? Oh yeah. Huh. I think it's similar with with French. My son just chose to do French in high school. I was like, what? Why are you doing French? He goes. um uh because nobody else is doing it i want want to be different (laughs) everyone's doing spanish or japanese or and i just want to be different like all right i think japanese would be fun to learn you know then i can finally have an excuse to watch anime be like no no, i'm just practicing my japanese but uh you know imagine i have a email time machine and you can send a message to yourself your younger self what would you uh what would you send to your younger self Oh, I, I would say take more risk. Definitely take more risk. Mm. Go all in and in some investments and that. I don't know. I saw so many opportunities just being in Silicon Valley slip through my fingers that, you know, at the time I just looked and going, oh, this is a dumb idea. Or mm. or looking back, it should have been like, you know, go all in if you fail, whatever. But uh, taking taking a few more, taking a lot more risk. That's what I would yeah. say. Yeah, I think I think that is a common refrain of of older folks is yeah, uh, take more risks. Well, it's kind of I, I often funny heard when I was younger. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like growing up, you think you are taking risk, and then 
looking back, you're like, actually, no, I was just in my comfort, you know, stretching my comfort zone a little bit. Yeah. You know, but, you know, as, as you get older, because the projects you work on, the deals you work on, they all get bigger. And you're just basically stretching your comfort zone. I wish I'd just maybe, instead of say, take more risk, stretch your comfort zone as much as possible every day. I mm. think that would have been a message that would have resonated with the younger me a lot more. Because then I probably would have gone, okay, I, I, I can try this a little. I mean, I did take risk, you know, moving to countries and that. But, mm. um, you know, gosh, I remember 2013, this guy was pitching, you know, Bitcoin ID. And I was like, dumb. And another guy was, you know, I, there's so many ideas that have been pitched to me that later on, uh, I'm like, wait, that turned into a unicorn company that could have had such a huge day that, that should, should, uh, should have stretched my comfort zone. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I love that. Well, Sean, this was an amazing conversation. Thanks for shooting the shit with me for an hour. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Brian is a podcast host, podcast host. It's been an honor. <laughs> 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 thanks for coming on man appreciate it <laughs> thanks <laughs> enjoyed it cheers